Welcome to We Are Everyone, a video and podcast series powered by Pivotal Moments, and we focus on the intersection of mental wellness in the workforce. We bring together young professionals and mindful executive mentors to bridge the generational gap and bring to the surface conversations about the importance of mental wellness and how to overcome career tradition challenges. Mental wellness is paramount. Join us. Welcome to We Are Everyone. I'm your host, Jen Sherman, and we have a very special guest today. We have Marissa Potts. She's also a Washingtonian. Well, I guess Alexandria, but same DMV uh, local. Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia. Whatever you want to call it. (laughs) Yeah, whatever you want to call it. But uh, right around the corner, uh, I just want to welcome Marissa Potts. She's the founder and CEO of Spotted MP. Uh, Dime a dozen, another amazing, you know, female entrepreneur, mompreneur. So welcome, Marissa. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Like, you know, very grateful, very blessed. So thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Thank you for being here. So we always like to start the show with a statistic. And as we know, you know, 2020 was a difficult year. And as studies show, this was particularly true among women. And not saying anything about men, but since we are two women, let's talk about uh, mental health. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, women lost around 1 million jobs more than men. And a report from the National Center for Health Statistics found about 46% of women said they were experiencing symptoms related to depression or anxiety by the end of 2020. From your perspective, Marissa, what are some of the challenges that women face, especially during the current state whether they're beginning their careers or maintaining a seasoned career? Well, I can certainly say, you know, as a mom myself and also, you know, as someone who runs her own business, uh, the challenges have definitely have been real this year. Um, you know, there has been a lot of uh, stories in the news that have shown very real and raw what women are going through during these challenging times, just kind of peeling the curtain of back of, how, how households are operating when you have, you know, your children or, or in, in your husband and yourself, like all under one roof and trying and trying to work and trying to, to balance it all in between, you know, the housework, um, you know, the, the obligations as, as, as a businesswoman. And it's been it's been extremely tough. And, you know, when majority of the women also have the burden of managing a household, um, it, the the rubber band is stretched way too you know super thin, and so there has been a lot of my I will say you know of my my female counterparts um, that have have decided to step down or cut de- or cut back their hours, in which is very unfortunate because all of them deeply love you know the professions that they're in, but you know I can't tell you how many times that I've had conversations work related with um, working moms where they're trying to have a business conversation and they've got four kids in the background, you know, running around trying to manage virtual learning or distance learning and screen and it's chaos. It's, it's pure chaos. And so, you know, the challenges are certainly real. Um, This is something with women stepping back now that is going to be a huge impact for years to come in terms of the workforce. How do we re-engage those women to come back um, once, you know, the economy and the world is kind of settled in, but, uh, it certainly has shipped and, and we haven't even also talked about, you know, the challenges dealing with, you know, gender pay gap in general, you know, which is a huge, huge issue, still a huge issue. Yeah. I mean, speaking of which, uh, I guess when I was in, um, when I was in college, my first thesis, my freshman year was on breaking the glass ceiling you know, before I even wasn't, I mean, I was in the workforce maybe with, from an internship perspective before college, but nothing, you know, I always thought I kind of had the, the, before I learned the word perspective and what that actually meant is I thought, you know, I'm going to come in, break that glass ceiling, you know, that this is not, this can't be true. And then as I've, you know, experienced more of the workforce, it it is true. And it's, it's one of those things that, I like to look at as we're all equals, but we just as equals need to combat some of these just old systematic like aspects that have just never been really changed, addressed, but not truly changed. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say absolutely. And I think it starts with companies being more empathetic about their employers and and in, in situations particularly like this. Uh, where 
they have to understand that the demands and the work demands that used to be in the you know older times during a pandemic and beyond like we have to be more flexible and accommodating um to to your staff there was which really um, took me back um uh there was one of my girlfriends was telling me that she was actually had her baby in her arm. She's trying to conduct a meeting and her boss, you know, the boss, the, the baby was a little fussy and the boss was like, I'm going to need you to take care of that. On a Zoom call during a pandemic. So these are, I mean, these are just, that's just one of countless examples of how, you know, the mind shift from a business standpoint needs to, to, you know, it needs to adjust because the old antiquated thinking, the old antiquated, um, you know, expectations just can't change. She was completely taken aback, but he said that on a Zoom call and, you know, we just can't have that anymore. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and as we get later in the interview and something I, you know, love to talk about are just the four generations in the workforce. So we can address some of that more with these different types of communication styles and, you know, the just kind of older traditions versus newer traditions and just society in general. But I was wondering, you know, as we talk about some of these challenges, you know, what are some of the tools that we can use to combat this? Well, one of the things that I stick by um, very tried and true, the pandemic has definitely created a mind shift for me and understanding what things I need to keep me mentally sound mentally whole and and also to be able to balance everything there are two things in my um that are very important to me that are non-negotiable one is working out um that is something that that is my time first thing in the morning um you know to to get it and i work i've worked out six days a week actually thanks to the pandemic pandemic but that's actually therapy that's the way i'm able to control my mental headspace that is my time not to be interrupted in order for me to um, be grounded for the rest of, you know, the rest of the day. And then the second thing um, is, is sleep. Um, you know, I'm 48 and, you know, there, you can get into that cycle pretty quickly of lack of sleep and, you know, worrying and, then, and that helps contribute to the anxiety and just spiral really quickly. But those are two things that literally are non-negotiable for me. Um, is work out and sleep. And when sleep, you know, if even though I have like a crazy schedule and, you know, feel like I need to get everything done, you know, today, like it, there is a hard stop. Like I'm in bed at 10 o'clock, <laughs> you know, the, that, that seven to eight hours sleep is, is critical because you need to be mentally fresh and, um, you know, and, and even more so during these challenging times, there are things that we had to, um, you know, kind of pull back from in order to be mentally fresh and try to juggle anything. And I think the third thing, honestly, is alcohol. Um, I love my wine. Um, you know, I have, I know a lot of women and I know it's been a lot of studies where, you know, women are drinking a lot of wine during these different times or a lot of alcohol during these times. And so, you know, during the week, I, you know, I cut it, cut back to, to nothing and only save it for the weekends. But those little things have helped me as terms of my tools. Yeah, I will say, you know, I think something that particularly in the beginning, it was like with the first wave, if you will, where everyone was just like, uh, let's just like, we don't know, let's just buy cookies. And I remember one of our, uh, um, Christina Buiri, she was on as our mutual friend and she was like, we were baking cookies and drinking wine that first month. And then I was like, hold up, like, this is just not, uh, uh, like we can't go on this way just because I've noticed too. And I'll share that with you, Marissa, is that the sleeping and the working out religiously, like that's my first thing in the morning. Or if I can't hit it in the morning, I'll hit it in the middle of the day, like just a quick 20 yes. or something on the bike. And mm -hmm. it's just been such a great mindset and re reset. And I think the one thing that I've been trying to do as well is just kind of cut back during the week on the wine because you don't. You know, well, when we were out and about before, you know, in the social scene, and Christina also said this, you know, we were just out and about and we were at these networking events and it was just there. And it was like, all right, you know, you're in yeah, this It was always there. <laughs> it was always there. And, you know, then you have the cheese and the crackers and all this stuff. And then you're just like, ugh, you feel not great the next day. And at the end of the day, you need to show up. And these days too, I've noticed it's like, 
if we're really sitting at our desk all day, not moving, and then you go into maybe you actually start your, you know, the happy hour at 4.30 instead of 6.30 or 5 because of whatever, then you have the more of the food and then you wake up the next day and you're like, ugh. I don't feel that great. But then you have to go back to your desk to get on Zoom calls all day. It's just like, it's not. It's a cycle. It's It's a a total cycle. cycle. And alcohol also interrupts your sleep. And we all, you know, we all know the faults in that. And and so I've had to, you know, I was getting in that rut, you know, a glass of wine every night just to kind of relax. But it, you know, I was like, I I gotta, I gotta curve it back. And it definitely have, have, you know, seen huge improvements. Yeah. Well, I think that's my next combat because I was like, you know, I I think that I've been doing a lot of tea. So like a tea and a bath has been and we can get down to one winter, which which uh, how do we flex our mental fitness muscle? But no, I love that. And speaking of which, let's talk about mental fitness. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we at Pivotal Moments, we've been talking about uh, mental fitness, you know, starting the show back in. It's about to be our anniversary. Um of in May when we started during mental health awareness month and rather than, you know, me- using the term mental health, sure. But mental health ser- seems we rather be more proactive about our mental health than reactive. So mental fitness or things that we can do, what you were just talking about, some of these tools of having strengthening our mental fitness muscles. So I was just wondering, you know, what do you think when you hear of the term mental fitness? There are four things that come to mind for mental fitness, um, kind of four pillars that I kind of operate with. One, emotional, um, being, you know, self, your self-esteem, you know, your confidence level, you know, being, you know, just feeling good, you know, in your body, you know, mind, spirit, you know, that's one area. Uh, social, uh, of course, this past year has been very tough to be social with our friends. And, you know, given the profession I'm in is communicating as a, you know, PR, marketing PR professional, I, I'm social a lot. And so, you know, this year, this past year has been a little bit challenging and trying to alter what that, so, you know, how can you still be social and still, um, how can that part fill your cup? Obviously we have Zoom, we have other things. Um, but, this past year is in the social category has also taught us to slow down and actually have, you know, authentic conversations with folks, pick up the phone and chat with someone, you know, versus I'm busy, da, 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 da. Um, you know, being very intentional with your social conversations. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've picked up the phone and called folks and had our conversations just to, shoot the stuff, so to speak. And, you know, and I think those are great. I think that's really key for mental fitness, um, takes your mind off anything that's going on, you know, at the moment. And then the third thing um, uh, is physical, of course, you know, trying to um, take care of your body, you know, what you put in, you know, exercise. I know we kind of, you know, say that. But then the fourth thing that's kind of, you know, the, the, people don't think about is financial. Um, And, you know, that is a big part of mental fitness, at least for me, you know, it's not about, you know, how much money you make or anything, but just feeling comfortable. And especially this is more important for women, you know, are are you financially sold, you know, well, are you found financially well, um, if their case, there's a disaster, or, you know, just living within your means, Um, and you know, are you in, you know, are you financially sound? And that's, it's really tough when we're talking about women, you know, stepping out of, you know, stepping down from the workforce, but those are the four pillars that mental fitness means to me. Yeah. I think those are very important. And speaking of which, you know, I'm not going to preview this because it's not set in stone yet, but we are most likely going to be launching a finance channel, um, around, you know, and even the word finance. Yeah, I'm just like finance. It's like, uh, which you need to meet the potential host, um, which I'm not going to say on, on, on the camera now, but she's a <laughs> force to be reckoned with, uh, another really strong woman. And the thing is, when you hear finance, like when you just said that, I thought, oh gosh, I have to check my capital one today, like I do every single day, because, <laughs> you know, particularly as you say, you know, we've had the whole shift of this whole idea of, um, you know, that kind of white picket fence, 1950s, stay at home housewife was like, don't get me wrong. I, 
I love I love the idea of the housewife sort of thing or a house husband of equal partnership trash. You know, we do the dishes, do the trash, <laughs> whatever that may be. Having said that, we're in a world right now where you know we as women have been able to rise up the corporate ladder, start our own businesses, do these things that I always thank the older generations for paving the path for us. It's just at the same time now, this whole idea of financial literacy and having our own money, you know, aside from having that emergency fund, it's very nerve wracking, particularly during these times. And I think a lot of us, there's, it's kind of like those things you don't want to talk about ever. Um, and finances are always something that, and is, you know, you ever talk about how much money you make or all this stuff. But for me, when I'm talking to my other fellow entrepreneurs, I'm like, Ugh, I'm stressing out. This invoice is late and like I have to pay a million. You know, it's like, you know, we're, we all feel that. We all feel that. Right. I think that's a really good point, Marissa, to bring up because I think some people feel, they don't like talking about it. And it's like, it's they in don't. front of us. Yeah. It's in front of us. And I know there's such a movement to have women more aligned with their financial health, you know, and well being. Um, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I was one of them. I'm like, I don't want to talk about money, you know, or, you know, but like really being in control and independent and also thinking about the future. You know, one of the things we all have in common is that we're going to get old. So, and that might happen in partnership, having a spouse or not having a spouse. So how are you as your own self being financially whole and, and, and well, you know, in, in that space. So. Yep. You just, that, that stuff, that's where it adds up. I've been thinking about this as I'm like, okay, this needs to go here. Like just put it away and don't see it anymore. You can't get it out. So it's like, it's no, it yeah, trust me. Work. I love to shop. <laughs> yeah. no, me too. Especially, it's kind of like who let the dogs out with this pandemic where I'm like, I haven't been out in so long when I just got like, when I like really came back, it was like probably like February. And I was like, Oh, March was just, it was, you know, it was just not, but you know what? You live and learn, right? You live and learn. Well, everyone um, keeps saying we're about to embark on the roaring twenties, the modern roaring twenties. I think everyone's <laughs> Spending is going to be through the roof. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, frankly, we need it kind of as economy right now. Just hopefully that doesn't put us like in debt and then we have to go to the, you know, the whole cycle. Um, right. <laughs> it's like, don't go crazy. <laughs> yeah. Let's not go crazy. Well, speaking of the roaring, uh, roaring twenties, let's talk about, um, the four generations that are in the workforce. So this is a topic which I mentioned has been really dear to my heart, um, for before I even started, we are everyone, um, and talking about the future of the workforce. And like I said, you know, I'm a millennial. I know we have our stuff around millennials, but each generation has their stuff. It's just who's the newest to the, you know, to the, who's the newest to the workforce. So right now we have Gen Z, millennials, Gen Xers, and baby boomers. And mm -hmm. as we spoke about, you know, sometimes, you know, there's different generations communicate differently about topics and, um, you know, particularly with things that come around mental health finances, communication, um, how, you know, what has your experience been in this area and, you know, how can we better communicate, learn to understand each other, support each other, even though our outlooks and experiences differ? I thought this was a great question and it fits perfectly with some of the work I'm doing with one of my clients. Um, I, one of my clients is the National Council on Aging and they do a lot of work in helping all, all or older adults age well and also seeing that aging is a social justice issue. Going back to my point of, you know, all of us as individuals have one thing in common, which is we all are going to get old. So with that, we all need to understand, um, you know, and, and learn from various generations, either it's you know, their experiences, um, you know, their skills, you know, kind of their journey. And there is a lot of um, companies right now that are that are working better or working harder to link or, you know, blend uh, multi-generation you know, workforce so they can understand each other and how, you know, and, and learn, you know, from each other. There's been some interesting matchups similar where they'll have a, you know, millennial and then they have a baby boomer and you sit down and, and you have a conversation. There was actually something recently on the news similar to that where there's a college student literally interviewing um, you know, an, an older lady uh, that was in a nursing home and just kind of, you know, learning 
you know, their path and, and to help grow. And that's more of that needs to happen. And I think because of the pandemic, we, it has shined a light um, on, on an unfortunate level of how the older adults, the baby boomers were deeply impacted during COVID. And, and what you saw was the shift of millennials, you know, or myself, you know, that's having to help older adults or your parents or what have you kind of navigate through this, whether it's simply uh, getting on appointment for a vaccine because there's a technology barrier or, you know, disparity issues, you know, related to that. Um, so there has to be, um, and there's, there's organizations like National Council on Aging that are moving forward to have more intergenerational education and learning experiences because, you know, we're all going to get old and we all can learn something. And, you know, those, those millennials that you, mentioned, you know, soon they're going to be the baby boomers. There's like 1 billion of them, you know, so how can we, um, how can we learn from one another? Also, how can we reskill our older generation? Um, there, you know, there's a time where, you know, you thought that you were 50, that you were too old. Well, I'm 48. I, I'm, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon, you know, so, you know, kind of changing that perception, of what's defined as old, but also, you know, utilizing our wonderful baby boomers that some of them are not ready to, to hang up their hat. So how can we provide them the tools we need to reskill them and continue to be, you know, continue to contribute to our society? So, you know, I, I think, you know, having these initiatives to, to blend um, different, you know, generations together is, is more important than ever now. I completely agree. And I think, you know, as I'm hoping that this pandemic has really been an opportunity for all of us to come together as these four different generations. Listen, my daddy hates when I tell this story. Well, he probably, if he listens to my podcast, he knows I tell this story on a bunch of the podcasts. But, you know, when he, he's 59, he is always, he's been a lawyer for his whole career. And, you know, the lawyer, the law firm system's a little more, outdated with technology. So going from the office every day to Zoom or the web chat, that was a huge, and he teaches right. too. It was a huge shift. And I'm Absolutely. saying he's all, he's all stressed out. And we are all living at, um, we are all living together uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, he would just be like, can you please come over? I was like, I'm trying to figure out this. But, you know, it was very nerve wracking and scary for someone who's typically in person. And I think more so than putting like, Ha ha, they don't know how to use Zoom versus like, wait, no, how can I help you use Zoom? You know, exactly. how can I, you know, I was talking to someone else who's that, that has never, their whole career has never been on a computer. It's all just been in the shop, right? Or retail. And I'm like talking about a PowerPoint. They're like, what's a PowerPoint? I'm like, it's a PowerPoint. Like, it's like, you know, it, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's a PowerPoint. But if you've never on your computer, you don't know what a PowerPoint probably is. And so mm -hmm. I think it's just, having this like empathy and also understanding from both. It's like this whole idea of the upskilling and skills that you should be. I always want to be learning no matter how old I am, because it's kind of like if something happens and my associate or someone goes out and I need to use a PowerPoint and I don't know what a PowerPoint is, you know, I think that's how we can always continue to teach each other. Um, and be, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a lot of companies, they'll, they'll look at your age, quite frankly, and just say, okay, John is this age, he's old, and we should send him an early retirement notice, you know, that kind of thing versus, hey, John, you're this age, do you want to learn a new skill or providing programs that he might want to do something? He might not, John might not be ready to retire yet, you know, so like, it's, it's that shift of, you know, everyone still has a little bit, you know, still has a lot more gas in the tank to give. Like, so how can we provide the tools and resources for them to still work in the workforce, you know, retrain and what have you. And, you know, there's, like I said, there's organizations as well as some legislation on the Hill to do that, or that is in motion to do that. And, you know, just kind of squash the whole ageism, you know, you know, discussion. It was, I don't know if you remember when, when, Biden, President Biden was going up the steps to Air oh. Force One and he tripped. Well, they were calling him old because he tripped. Well, guess what? I tripped up my steps 
coming that, into I, the I, house. That is like, <laughs> I mean, they, they, they he, Biden was not exactly set up for success uh, in regards <laughs> to his age for this. I mean, you know, it's just it like it's it's just people like to make fun of other people. That is like unfortunately how most of society is. It disgusts me. I mean, I think some things like can be funny, but it's like it, you know, it's just that people are judgmental, and it's it's something that is. Uh, and it was sad. Yeah. And actually, it, it took it, it was it was so. Um, I think it was in the New York Times. I'll have to replay, but it was. One of the reporters, uh, national reporters, was so upset. They wrote about, you know, ageism because of that. You know, people are like, oh, he fell up the steps. You know, now he's old and he can't, you know, run the country. <laughs> I was like, come on. But this is this is countless examples. <laughs> I mean, well, I'm not allowed to wear these slides that I'm wearing right now because I, I literally almost fell and tripped in them. So they're my house shoes, which I could also <laughs> fall and trip in my house. So I should probably not wear them. But you know, same, same. I mean, it just, it's interesting. I think if we can really just, I'm going to go back to my meditative language of, we can really just all hold space for each other, you know? And I think from this pandemic, we're seeing that. And, you know, um, people who are probably not as open about things and feelings are now being more open about it. I mean, it's just, you have, you have to be. And, you know, I, I, I've been saying this is either you can sink or swim right now. Um, or just mm -hmm. try to survive. And the thing is, is that I've seen a lot of leaders just kind of go in cocoon because they can't face it because this is not something they've ever faced or there's leaders who really have stepped up. And um, I think for someone like you who's been in your career and, 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 and had your own business for so long, you, know, you have the luxury um, of being that, seeing, having eyes in a lot of different organizations and being able to adapt that experience to your other clients too. And I think that's something that's really interesting um, as well. And I would like to ask, just following up around mental fitness and communication, which is so important. I mean, communication is, I mean, in your love life, your professional life, your you know, your um, friendships, anywhere. It's it's all about communication. So I was wondering for you and how you've adapted. You know, how how have how is how significant. Um, is communication been and how has that kind of evolved when it comes to your mental fitness um in your career um i would say our voice is so powerful and we have to use it to the best of our ability to communicate um whatever we we need to say whether in a in a in a business setting um from the pandemic uh, messaging out and communicating how your business is being impacted, but also how are you in it being innovative and being adaptable um, in in this current space to personal. Um, everyone around me knows that I I they know where I stand, and I'm big stickler about communicating properly. And sometimes, even if it's difficult things, you have to communicate. But you know, I think even more so with the pandemic. Um, it's important to understand where people are coming from or where there's, you know, where they're, what their viewpoints are. And sometimes you'll agree to disagree, but, um, you know, communicating, uh, using your voice, speaking up. I mean, we've seen a lot of speaking up, you know, around all the social justice issues that have been going on. And, you know, I share that with my, my 12 year old son that, you know, in, in, in addressing his questions as we go through all the things that we've been seeing in our country, that your voice is the number one power, powerful tool that you have, and you have to use it to speak up. And sometimes your voice will not be the, the favorite one, but you have to stay true to whatever you believe in and, and stand your ground. So, um, you know, it, it's okay to be the only one, you know, at, at a table and, and eat alone sometimes, but, you know, and sometimes that, that eating alone will, will reap some, some fruits of labor down, down the road. So communication is very important. You know, I deal, deal with it with my clients every day and helping tell their stories out in the public eye. Um, also, you know, through their marketing of, you know, of their, of their, their business. So it's, it's my number one powerful tool. I love that. And I also just going back to, you know, your, how you communicate with your son, because I think there's, you know, of course there's the professional world, but there's also our youth and 
educating our youth and saying, and I work with the Boys and Girls Club and we virtually, and just hearing these children speak and they are so insightful. But I think as adults, we have to empower them to be insightful and say like, that's okay. It's okay to be sitting at the table alone because it's not necessarily a negative thing. You know, I think it's being able to empower them for their own voice, being unique, being different. I mean, these children, they're like talking about, you know, weird. And and the other friends like, no, you're just unique. You're different. I'm like, I love how they're uplifting each other. And I personally think maybe because I'm older now and I hear it differently, but we did not speak that way when I was in middle school. I mean, we no. were <laughs> brutal. And I'm like, okay, well, hopefully, you know, this next generation's doing more better with the kids because they can have these open conversations. But man, oh man, like I love that you I love that you say this. Um, so how do you how do you and kind of going outside, let's just talk about women. You know, how do you, you know, how do you kind of promote these types of approaches to your women's circle, whether that's, you know, your, your circle of influence or your girlfriends or, you know, some of the other women you work with? Yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot of women out there who feel um, like they can't speak up, um, you know, where they don't either don't want to rock the boat or they're actually the only female at the table or, you know, feel like their voices aren't, aren't being heard. And I've actually had a lot of these conversations actually over the past year where it just seems like everyone has, you know, emotions have bubbled up to the surface and, you know, the steam's going off because people are just, you know, women are just frustrated. Um, but, you know, I am a big advocate of, of with women to tell them you have to use your voice and even more so where women are now front and center where I hate to say that it's our time. It should always be our time, but it's certainly our time right now where people are, are trying to um, empower women, support women. Um, if you're not getting the support you need, you have to speak up. And if it, if your employer or whatever the, the, the issue is, is not supporting you, it's okay to, to, to walk away. And so, you know, those are the things where you just need to stand your ground um, and, and say, I need to be supported. And this is what I need to be supported. It could be an inter- interim thing that you need, or it could be long-term. Um, but you know, I, enough's enough, you know, kind of sense, you know, sense, and we can't be quiet anymore. I'm, I'm always a believer that, you know, silence is complacency. And so, you know, I, it, we cannot come from a place of being complacent and, and, and not wanting to rock the boat. I agree. And that's something that I like try to tell myself every day as you know sometimes I'm just scared to communicate or ask for something and I'm like what what is the worst that can happen you sit at the table (laughs) alone for lunch you know what I'm saying like is that the worst and yeah well Madonna has a favorite quote to that it says people don't get what they want because they don't ask for what they want (laughs) it's exactly that and then you know and then you go in the circles and I'm like Okay, I will I process through people, that's what I do. But if I'm processing too long, like get at like make a decision, Jen. Like stop. You know, it's like process, make a decision and keep it moving. You know, so um that's that's interesting. But another question we like to ask our guests always is what does mental wellness mean to you? Mental wellness means to me just being at peace with my life, um, you know, being grateful for what I have and what I've worked for and the loving family, um, that I have, you know, that, that is behind me. Um, you know, my, my son is amazing. Um, he's actually, it has been the rock during these challenging times when we feel like we want to hang up the boxing gloves during this pandemic. He's, you know, he's, He's the one who's like, nope, we've got this. You know, we're tough cookies. Um, my husband, you know, seeing it, you know, being a partner by my side through this. And it's been bumpy, you know, as we, we both work from home and all the things. But, uh, you know, kind of going back to communicating um, what you need during these challenging times and what is not working. And, you know, this is what I need without, you know, to avoid, you know, a a full mental explosion. (laughs) So, um, you know, I think being at peace, um, you know, is important. And I think also being 
okay to let go as well as say no um, at times. So uh, that one is a real toughie for me. Um, and, you know, I, I try to focus on the positives that this pandemic has come through just from, you know, personal growth or what have you. But uh, being able to let go, you know, where in the past you get so riled up and like, and, and just when you kind of reset, you know, with everything that's going on, just let it roll off your shoulders and also being able to say no, um, if it doesn't fit, if it doesn't create fire in your belly, it doesn't sit in your heart or it causes that anxiety and stress and depression where you just get so anxious because you have to do this thing and you really don't care for it, say no. Um, and, and so oh, I think women in particular really struggle with that, um, you know, not wanting to, you know, say no, because they think it's, you know, it's a ding on their record, but you have to. And that's, I think that's what mental health and, and fitness means to me. Yeah, I love that answer. And the power of saying no also really, I think, builds I don't know if I like the word clout, but that's what's coming into my brain right now. But like clout for yourself, not clout for others, because then you're giving you're giving yourself more power in your space. You know, a lot of the work I've done in the pandemic is um, a lot of self work. I've been working with a spiritual guide, and the idea of like waking up every day like it's a spa day, not letting vampires take your energy, and showing like up and having intention, but not thinking, you know, we put so much sometimes, not we as in you and I, but in general society and women, we put a lot of time and energy into others. And it's like, if the more you take that energy and put it into yourself, the more you can actually make an impact for others, but you have to take care of yourself first. So saying no, creating those boundaries. And, you know, I, I'm sure it's for your 20 years of having your business and everything, you know, the power of saying no, it's hard because if you say no, is, is that going to affect the, you know, is that going to affect cash that's coming in? Is that going to, you know, how is that going to, how is that going to affect even my bottom line? But I think the more sometimes you say no, the more it opens up to other opportunities. So. Absolutely. And I certainly had to learn that from a business setting, you know, where, you know, as an entrepreneur, you feel like you need to take in all engagements, all the projects that come in or, you know, contracts. And, you know, I have learned over the years that and and thankfully in the position to be able to do this now where yeah I, I i will turn down work if it's not you know something i'm passionate about or it puts a fire in my belly or you know it's it's kind of a mundane thing um but you know like you said that's okay and every time i've done that majority of the time has opened a new door for something where i'm like yeah i want this so you know that's 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 perfectly fine to say no and you know, I have friends that joke, they're like, oh yeah, Marissa has no problem saying no. If it's not, if it's not getting her, <laughs> she's going to say no, thank you. <laughs> That's it. I mean, but, but your friends know that too. It's kind of, you know, or I've, I think when your friends know that you put that into the universe, that's just kind of what you also bring. It's, you know, it's powerful. Um, and we like to end the interview with what's that resource. And we spoke a little bit about this in the beginning. Having said that, that means you just have to say a different answer now since you already said a couple of those tools. Um, okay. So what's that resource? How do you, how do you practice preparing with um, adversity mentally? And then how do you, I love this. I love using this term. How do you flex your mental fitness muscle? Oh, um, Flexing my fit, mental fitness muscle. One one thing is just I've I've learned learning a new skill actually, um, and one of those things is breath work. I've been working on breath work, and that's something that I would admit um, I would say old me, which I say old pandemic, <laughs> pre pandemic. You know, I would think breath work was something that was a little hokey, um, but. Uh, it has really helped with uh, just kind of calming me down, you know, when I feel the anxiety start to, to, to bubble up and um, work on breath work to just kind of take those deep breaths to just kind of get your nervous system back down and at a, a calm and neutral state. And um, I would encourage folks to, to try it. Um, I kind of, you know, it is definitely has helped me is just trying to, to work on the breath work where, you, you know, when you start feeling like you're going to hyperventilate to just kind of bring it down. Um, 
Yeah, I think the power of your breath is I was so I was against it. I was like, I can't meditate, all this stuff. This was a couple of years ago when my mother was like, You need to do TM. I was like, Okay, I don't want to spend the fifteen hundred dollars on TM, but I will do this in my own way when I'm ready. And I think the breath work and it for me, I think the working out is also a form of meditation and you know, releasing, but I think the power of sitting, even if it's three minutes, people are like, I don't have time. You can Probably right in between my this interview and my next call, I'm gonna take five minutes and just sit and breathe, and the and it just it's powerful. And you don't, I think, too, Marissa, where a lot of people think about it, it's like, oh no, you know, like I can't just not think about anything. Don't put don't put pressure on yourself around the breath work. Just if you have thoughts that come in, that's okay, you know, like mm-hmm. that's okay. Just be intentional about the breath work. Absolutely. Because we're always operating, most of us in fight or flight, right, mode. And so just, it's hard for us who's always the energizer bunnies, go, go, go to just be still. Like like you said, for three minutes. Three be minutes. Be still. Three minutes. And then if you want. Breath work. Yeah. Well, and I'll just give a shout out to Emily Rosowski. Um, she is a, she is a dear friend of mine. She's in Costa Rica right now doing some great work and um, spiritual work. And she is the, she would perform breath work on me. If it, even if you want to have like that, I look, it's like a going to the spa and it's like an hour and it's just magical. So I don't know um, if you've awesome. met her or know of her, but she's just great. So I'll definitely connect you to uh, post this, post this interview. Please. That's awesome. Yes, That's yes, yes. Cool. Well, this has been awesome, Marissa. I'm so happy you were able to join us. You look beautiful as always. Um, do you have anything oh, else that you, you would like to leave the audience before we wrapped up today? I just, I would just say that, uh, you know, continue to work on feeding your present brain and sunsetting your worry brain. That's all, you know, just try to work on being present. Um, worrying will get you into a downward spiral. So, you know, just continue to feed your present brain and it'll, it'll help you tremendously. So I love that. I love the sunset. I was like, I'm going to have to tell our uh, engineer to pull one of those as the social uh, social quotes. Um, well, this has been awesome, Marissa. Thank you so much. We have Thank Marissa you. Pott. She's the founder and CEO of Spotted MP, a completely amazing, also female entrepreneur. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we will catch you next time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning into another episode of We Are Everyone. You can subscribe to We Are Everyone on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and also be sure to visit www.pivotalmoments.org to learn more about the organization. And we also want to hear what mental wellness means to you. So you can follow us on social media, submit your video, and uh, we will catch you next time. Thank you so much.